Hello, you are listening to The Natural Healing Show for UK Health Radio. I'm your host, Katherine Kurigan, medical intuitive healer, Amazon number one best-selling author. You can find out more about me and my work at katherinekurigan.com and unlimitedenergynow.com. While you're there, definitely sign up for my newsletter so you can learn even more about how you can heal yourself naturally. Now, our guest today is George Ackerman. George Ackerman is the co-host of a new podcast called the Together for Sharon podcast. And you can find out more about George Ackerman and his wonderful work at his website, togetherforsharon.com. Welcome, George Ackerman. Thank you for your time and your listeners and viewers. It really means the world to me. So George Ackerman, and for our audience, we're going to be talking today about Parkinson's disease. What exactly is Parkinson's disease? Unfortunately, it's a disorder. It's neurological, and it's uh, with the movement. So it affects an ability uh, for an individual to really, over time, uh, move, uh, affects their health uh, overall. Unfortunately, my mother passed four years ago due to Parkinson's, and that's why I'm here advocating to share not only her journey and her memory, but mine as a caretaker. But it's really, uh, unfortunately, a progressive disorder that really gets worse over time. Uh, nerve cells, neurons, and parts of the brain weaken, and uh, they could damage, uh, be damaged or die, and, and also causes tremors and other symptoms that we can touch on. But the one unique thing I wanted to mention is everybody is so different, and that's the biggest challenge. What happened to my mother and our journey, very different than another individual who's going through the disorder. Now, as a medical intuitive healer with 30 years of experience in natural healing, I've worked with many clients who've had suffered from Parkinson's disease. And as you know, George Ackerman, there are stages of Parkinson's disease. And for example, last year, I worked with a gentleman who had stage four Parkinson's disease. He had to have round the clock caregivers. Um, his family had bolted bars to the wall so that when he started to fall, which he did all the time, he could grab onto the ball, bars at, um, on the walls. And as a healer, it was really very heartbreaking for me to do healing work with him when I put my hands on his brain, it felt like his brain was receiving constant electrical shocks. And I would not wish what he suffered on my worst enemy. So George Ackerman, can you explain for our audience, what are the stages of Parkinson's disease? Yeah, I think one of the problems right now and all over the world, not just the US or UK is really understanding Parkinson's and awareness. Uh, there's people who are misdiagnosed, there's people who are diagnosed, and there's, uh, like my mother, for instance, she had it for 15 years, but really didn't tell us about it till almost the last four. She didn't really, she was very independent, didn't want anyone to know, and some people sadly are ashamed because you're really not the same person you once were. I uh, documented her last year. Uh, she was only 69 when she passed, very young, and I videotaped, I kept a journal, I'm writing a book now, but I don't share the video because it really doesn't depict my mother in you know, our happier times. Some of the issues, uh, towards the beginning, she had stiffness in her left arm, but she was still able to drive, function, and walk. Over time, unfortunately, I learned about the stages. We didn't even know until we were already kind of thrown into stage four and five, which was almost too late. So maybe if we had known much earlier that we could have done a little more. Also, been tremendous advances throughout society through research. So that's a good a positive such as dieting and exercise. We found the key to really uh, exercise now to slow down the neurological disorder. Again, I'm not a medical doctor. I just go from my mother's experiences. I always say to contact your uh, local uh, medical uh, doctor in the field for any other areas. But some of the things that I noticed were tremors. She didn't have the external ones that you might see in some individuals. For example, Michael J. Fox, famous actor, but she did have in internal. She also had a little bit more slowness, uh, slowness of her uh, gait and also the ability to you know, move. And some of the other issues, like you mentioned, were balanced. So I had caretakers around the clock also, 
watching over her so she wouldn't fall because as you know I mentioned if you fall that makes it even 10 times worse yes and um, paradoxically yesterday last night I had a new yoga student come to my class and he told me confidentially he said my family doesn't even know but I had just been diagnosed with Parkinson's and he was a, he had been a regular exerciser throughout the life so he's somebody who had kept himself extremely fit but he specifically came back to yoga class because he had been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. So one of the things that is, I know that is very helpful for people with Parkinson's disease is music. So George Ackerman, the founder and co-host of Together for Sharing podcast, how important is music for healing Parkinson's disease? Uh I love that question because it's actually, uh, again, when I was thrown into it, you don't have a class to become a caretaker. You just do it. I didn't know about all these things like boxing and yoga and music. Well, we had, unfortunately, towards the end, we had long-term hospice, which is a new thing they're starting, where she was actually in hospice for a year. What that did was positive and negative. The positive was they actually offered, uh, you know, like a chaplain, a rabbi. So they had like a little bit of religion to come into the house for prayer. Uh, we weren't as religious, but at that time, you know, obviously it helps. We also had music therapy and they had animals. So they would bring an animal. Uh, it kind of discontinued that, but I love those ideas. Music was important. My mother played piano her whole life. We actually have her piano now. My daughter is playing it and learning now, which my mother would have loved. But you got it together for Sharon.com and scroll down to the bottom of the page. Um, sadly, there's actually a video and we had the music therapists come in a few times. Some days my mother was just too sick. She also had dementia and the hallucinations and delusions affected her badly. But there was one day a week before her passing where I played guitar for 15 years and I was able to sit down on video with the music therapist and we played the song Memory. When I was a little child, I'm from New York. My mother took me to see Broadway Memory uh, or Cats and we heard that together. So it really meant the world. And, and you can't hear it at the end of the recording, but my mother said thank you, and she loved it. And those were actually the last words she ever said. Ah, well, as a healer, again, with 30 years of experience, I have done many years of hands-on healing with people with Parkinson's disease to balance their cranial system. So you have a cranial system, you have cranial bones, and balancing the cranial system can help to heal the brain. And so I use cranial work and also I play healing music while I'm doing that work, which helps to harmonize the brain waves. So music therapy is extremely helpful for healing Parkinson's disease because it helps to heal the brain waves. Now, also uh, dancing too is a big thing uh, throughout the world now. Dancing for Parkinson's is uh, you know another amazing, so music and dance. Okay, so now um, you are a criminologist and a lawyer and a professor. How did you get involved in creating the Together for Sharon podcast? Yeah, it's funny because uh, I go by Sharon's son, George, because I don't feel I would be who I am today if it wasn't for the sacrifices my mother made. And uh, so before all this uh, caretaking, my mother kind of accelerated in her illness I worked in law enforcement as a reserve officer. I was also an attorney. I'm still an attorney in Florida and Washington, D.C. And I also finished my Ph.D. in uh, criminal justice. Uh, I used to fight, and I still do, but for victims of family members of homicide, so people who unfortunately lost their loved one due to crime, uh, I, I felt they were left out in society, and especially by the criminal justice system. So I've always been an advocate for victims' rights. And in a way, I correlate... Parkinson's patients and caregivers in a similar way because I find that they're forgotten also by the system, whether it's the medical health care. Uh, finally, they're passing, we hope, this Christmas or this holiday, the first ever in U.S. history bill. It's called the National Plan to End Parkinson's. It's actually moved from committee in the Senate to the House floor, and they believe they'll be voting. So we're actually in a momentous and historic podcast right now together live because after this, in a month or two, we might have the first 
ever funding to help patients who are diagnosed, caretakers, and to push further research to find a cure. Um, it's a great question, again, you had, because this is literally the time that will change everything. And in a way, it's sad. I feel a little selfish because, we, you know, my mother, it's kind of too late. But I've learned that in the last few months, this is not about me and my mother anymore. It's really about the whole world and anyone suffering from Parkinson's or in that fight. I just I do this for completely voluntary. I don't accept money. We don't accept donations. Uh, I do it all again just because I love everyone. I want to send support. I want people to know that they're they're never alone. I love that message, and um, I and thank you so much for being here on the Natural Healing Show for UK Health Radio to share. Now, um, earlier in previous episodes of the Natural Healing Show for UK Health Radio, we had a gentleman who talked about how Adderall and Ritalin, the medications frequently used for ADD medications, for ADD and ADHD, attention deficit disorder and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, that Adderall and Ritalin increase people's risk for mania and Parkinson's disease. So many of us are not aware of how the psychiatric medications that people take for other issues may actually set you up for Parkinson's disease later on. So I feel that the incidence of Parkinson's disease are only going to be increasing. From your understanding, George Ackerman, what are the risk factors for Parkinson's disease? Yeah, I mean, you again brought up an important topic. We actually had to go towards the end at the stage five to psychiatrist because my mother uh, had, again, dementia, and it was now causing hallucinations and delusions. I had to remove the phone because she had to, she called the police once because she thought there was someone harming her. Mm. One night was very sad. She had to go to the hospital. I, went, I brought her into the hospital. I went back to pick up some of her clothes. It was very unexpected. And throughout the room, she had post-it notes like we used to take notes. And on those notes, she wrote down names of animals and people who she wasn't sure if they were actually reality in the room or if they were not in the state or if they had already passed away. But the problem with, like you said, more medications or even some of the different diets and uh, nutrition, all of them are could be good, but everyone differs. Plus, some of them can also cause more problems. We don't know the 100% cause of Parkinson's, but now there's a lot of discussion about environment, especially pesticides, which is a big issue. It could be in our food. So there's a lot of uh, important areas, but I definitely feel that all the medicines she was taking might, you know, the levodopa, the carb, all these things might have helped a little with the Parkinson's, but definitely could have caused other issues, specifically in the gut and the stomach. She had horrible uh, constipation, and these are, again, tough topics, but we have to talk about them, and this program's amazing because of the topics that you cover and I'm very honest, I do a lot of uh, talking, but this was really unique to me because we're hitting on some important areas that aren't discussed. So I commend you also and thank you for that. Now, how is, so we know that Parkinson's disease is basically neurological degeneration. How is Parkinson's disease different from other forms of dementia? Yeah, this one's an interesting one. Again, I'm only talking on our experiences, but dementia didn't set in, I think, towards the last year. So she was able to still function. But under the last few years, she went from, you know, a cane and then from the cane to a walker, then from the walker to a wheelchair and then bed bound. So telling someone for, you know, 67 years who's been independent, be able to shop, drive, and taking away their, you know, ability to drive and to have a life uh, was very difficult but i think that over time and as you mentioned the different stages it kind of just gets worse they say that there's the music therapy the dancing the kickboxing that can slow down the progression but again if your loved one doesn't talk to it's very important to communicate because if we had that opportunity maybe 15 years prior i didn't know how serious it was i never even knew what parkinson's was and as we speak now, of course, I'm still learning every day. Yes, I have another client who is the wife of someone with Parkinson's disease. And her husband was a very successful executive. And so 
and she and I have had many discussions about he fakes it, right? So he fakes being okay. He fakes being able to function normally, but he can't. So it's it's a really hard disease for everyone. Now, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your mother? Because your mother was the person who suffered from Parkinson's and who's inspired your very caring volunteer work. Thank you. Yes, I mean, she was really my best friend. Uh, I She was a single mother of two and uh, she really gave up. She had a master's degree and she also was a school teacher and she gave it all up to take care of my brother and I. She supported me through everything from law school to police academy to this and that. I remember she's the first person I used to call anytime something good happened, anytime something bad, whether it's historic. We're from New York. I remember even when horrible issues like 9-11 occurred, I first thing I did was make sure my mother was okay. And, uh, you know, it's hard now because I look, you know, to the holidays. She's not with me. Uh, as a caretaker, we could have a whole other world of podcasts of how I kind of obviously wasn't feeling the literal conditions of Parkinson, but I felt in a way of secondary victim because I sitting there holding her hand, having her beg to tell me, will I be there for my granddaughter's wedding? Uh, will I get better? I, I had no answers and I don't lie. So uh, it was very heartbreaking. I, had, I still have grief today. The other day I did a podcast and I was amazing. Like today, went to the other room, saw my wife and started crying. And I'm 6'2", 200 pound and law enforcement, tough guy. But when it comes to these topics, it's heartbreaking because, again, we can't bring my mother back, but we can definitely keep her memory alive. And, again, I just don't want others to ever have to go through this. Yes. And as I said, you know, working with the gentleman that I did with stage four Parkinson's, I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy, the yeah. falling that he had, the fact that his his partner chose to keep him in their home at great expense and you know there are memory care places but this gentleman kept to keep his partner in the home and then he was incredibly stressed taking care of him and working hard to pay all the bills now with that let's take a break and listen to a message from one of our commercial sponsors here at uk health radio i'm katherine kerrigan medical intuitive healer and we're talking to george ackerman the co-host co of the Together for Sharing podcast. So George Ackerman, as you know, Parkinson's disease is a journey. And the person who has Parkinson's goes on this journey, but so do their family members. Um, when did you learn that your mother had Parkinson's and how long did it take her to get a proper diagnosis from the time she initially showed symptoms? As I've been writing my book, we've been talk, thinking about these topics and I was really saddened to realize that she had it for 15 years and didn't even really tell me at all until the like fourth year before she passed. So she had it for some time. Again, I'm not sure if she, I wish I could ask her today. I don't know if she was kind of ashamed or she was just uh, not aware even, or maybe society didn't even understand what Parkinson's was. We were told by several doctors, you do not die uh, from Parkinson's, you die with it. So in my mind, it was you know something we had to live with, she had to have but she still was able to function. Unfortunately, she went to a special study towards the last four years and they, you know, we had tried everything. Like if you name a list, we did it and I didn't want any regrets. Like I didn't want to say, oh, what if? So sitting here now, I still have no regrets because there was nothing left. But, uh, you know, we so she tried that program. We don't know, if, and I don't blame them, but they might've drastically changed her medications. And the day she came home from that time on is when it kind of just was a downhill Every day was something worse and worse and worse. And we, you mentioned financial. I mean, we were spending $12,000 a month just to have people around the clock watching over her. 
we were luckily able to keep her at her own home. We had just purchased a home where I'm sitting now talking to you, and there's a room that was hers, and unfortunately she didn't make it. So now even today when I walk through the halls of my own house, it kind of haunts me that this disease, you know, destroyed our family in a way. But I've gotten a few positives, obviously, meeting amazing individuals like you who inspire me. And I've learned that there's approximately a million people in the U.S. with Parkinson's, but around the world there's 10 million. So in the last four months, I've actually had a great opportunity, thanks to social media, to meet over 400 individuals, whether they have Parkinson's caretakers or organizations like Parkinson's UK. So I've actually interviewed Parkinson's UK, United Kingdom, and I've been able to really make this now not a, just about my wife, uh, my mother and I, but also about others, because it's really their journeys that inspire me and keep me hoping that one day we'll have a cure. Now, I can recall about two years ago working with a gentleman and also his partner, and the gentleman had just been diagnosed with stage one Parkinson's disease. So at that point, I believe he was still working but part of what I encouraged them to do was to come up with a plan. So when you realize that you have a progressive disease, you literally want to plan out your life. Like, what are we going to do now? You know, what do I want to enjoy now while I'm able to? Um, as you look back on the progression of your mother's disease, what sort of plan do you recommend for people with Parkinson's disease? as they look you know, towards the progression of the disease? I think planning is very important. Again, we were kind of out of it, out of nowhere, so we didn't have the time, but luckily my mother was a planner. She even planned her funeral. We didn't know when that would be. We were hoping it would be you know, 10 years, but she had everything planned, and that way I had to take over at a certain point her legal affairs, so she was very supportive, and she let me do that. You have to have someone you can communicate with, someone you rely on, somebody you can trust. So sadly, families, you know, if there's money involved, she had saved some money, but unfortunately it was all spent for her health. But even so, someone can take that. There's a lot of sad things that, you know, in the spur of the moment, that emergency situation come up. But even now it's like, we're still trying to cope with it because it was all like uh, out of nowhere. It just kind of hit us hard. She passed and we were hit with COVID. Then we had a lot of issues with the law enforcement world and even now, it's like, you know, we always are having something throughout the world. So it's, uh, you know, it's very hard to plan, but you definitely should at least have a will. Again, I'm an attorney. I don't do wills, but you should have a will. You should definitely have a, someone who will take care of the home and the property. You should definitely, hope, you know, plan a little time if you can. Enjoy it because you don't know when this disease will move and how rapidly. But I do believe you can live a good life uh, with Parkinson's if you're able to treat it. Uh, have the right doctors. It's very important to be, and be honest with your doctor. I, I listened to a lecture the other day. Doctor said that sometimes his patients don't tell him that they're even taking like special diet supplements and things where you can't hide things or that's going to affect how you're treated. But I think planning is very important. Yes. And having a plan for your finances, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. But, and making sure that there's someone that you trust who's handling your money. How would you describe Parkinson's in your own words? Well, because I'm biased. It's a horrifying disease that takes a loved one and really doesn't just take them. And not that any disease just takes them, but really kind of demoralizes the person, diminishes them. And I watched my mother in a sad way, you know, fade away in a way. Like she went again from the strong, independent woman who could walk miles and very smiling to somebody who, you know, was kind of not able to use a lot of her own facilities in her own body or mind and seeing that it's not just heartbreaking but it kills me because I wanted to do more I would have given her my arm or my body to so she could continue on but seeing that is something that you know haunts me I kept a journal every night just a few sentences and that's what I'm putting into a book to share her journey and remember her but the website togetherforsharing.com was really made because when I was going through this, I felt alone. But every there was stuff out there, but it was all over the place. So what I did is put it all in one specific place. If you go to the website, you'll see our story, uh, all the interviews I've done, places you can donate. We support the Michael J. Fox Foundation. 
the Parkinson's Foundation, the American Parkinson's Disease Association. We've raised in four years over $10,000. We've donated a lot. We do not accept us at all for, we don't want anything to do with the, you know, the money. We want it to go to the organizations who can, uh, you know, deal with that. Also, you see partnerships, other organizations I've joined with. And uh, finally, the media, which is where uh, I've really been able to reach out and because of, it, again, amazing individuals like you really spread the message. And finally, my goal is not even really, it sounds odd, you might be shocked, but I don't want to reach just the Parkinson's community anymore. My goal is to reach people who do not have Parkinson's and people who are not Parkinson's caretakers, because guess what? Unfortunately, like you said, it's a very uh, increasingly disease around the world. I can get it too. I'm not someone who's, uh, you know, not thinking with rationality, but we have to have everyone involved in this to gain a cure. Yes. Now, when people study stress, when stress experts study who's the most stressed, the most stressed people of all, of all professions are actually caregivers. So caregiving is an incredibly stressful uh, profession. Now, and I understand that you're a lawyer and a criminologist and a professional pro professor. What were some of the struggles that you faced while taking care of your mother? Um, as her symptoms progressed through Parkinson's disease? Uh, the worst is, you know, I felt stress, burnout, uh, not giving up, but there were days where I felt uncontrollable, like I didn't know what to do, who to turn to. Uh, I hired people who were terrible. Uh, we went through about like 60 caregivers to try it. And their job was really just to make sure she didn't fall. They weren't really, I was going to do the rest. But even that, I had to put video cameras in because my mother's delusions told me that she thought they were harming her. Luckily, they weren't, but they did neglect her. One person so I had to get rid of them. So it was like literally a constant battle. It wasn't really enough time to just help my mother and her medical issues. I had to also bring her to doctors. We had to go to, uh, you know, different therapists, therapy. So whether it was speech or so many different therapy, like physical, uh, music therapy, and then so and then on top of that, I have my own family, my own work, and. I was a big lover of fitness, but I it also sacrificed. But, you know, again, I would do it again to help my mother. But the worst feeling out of it all is I just couldn't find the cure. Yes. Now, here we are at the Natural Healing Show for UK Health Radio. And we've talked about yoga. We've talked about movement therapy. We've talked about kickboxing. We've talked about exercise to work on balance. Uh and music therapy, in your opinion, having observed your mother, what natural healing modalities appeared to be the most helpful for your mother? She actually liked all of that. She uh, she even wore like the magnet on her back. She, she had a lot of back. She also had fibromyalgia and dyskinesia and dystonia. These are all things that come like the curling of the toes from Parkinson's in the medicine. Uh, she definitely liked, you know, vitamins and dieting. We tried big time with health, but after a certain point, when she reached stage five, I said, forget it. I'm going to buy her her favorite chocolate cakes. And because, you know, we didn't know at that point. So it was very tough. And like I said, we had to have nurses 24 seven because of the stomach issues. So that was uh, keeping her up 24 seven. So she didn't sleep. I and mean, it was just, again, one thing after another. I don't have any good recommendations or we could have changed. The only thing I can think of is really uh, maybe, my opinion, the dancing and the music was really important. I, she didn't really get a chance, even the like karate and things. And they even have Tai Chi now. They have so many options, but if you're not aware of them, that's the problem. And that's why we're here today. Now, how are you raising awareness about Parkinson's so that other people can learn about it and learn what their options are? That's a my that's my passion. You know, I've given up a lot of my own life, even my own family. Sometimes I sacrifice time. I'm online twenty four seven. So if you go to togetherforshine dot com in the bottom, it links to seven different social media. So I'm on all of them. I just try hard to keep pushing the importance of understanding Parkinson. I have a lot of uh, you know posts I do, but now a big thing is I've started a lot of multiple uh, areas of podcasts. I'm starting. Uh, one, it's Q&A, where I'll just interview people in the community about Parkinson's. We have the Together for Sharon podcast, where 
now my wife and I sit down and we actually interview individuals in the Parkinson's community. So it's great because you have a female perspective of the caregiver. So it's not just me. Also, I just started a podcast, uh, Unscripted, with three individuals who have Parkinson's, and that's been incredible because there's not a lot out there, sadly, with a podcast or a talk where it brings the caretaker and those diagnosed together. And that's some, one of my favorite things. We had our first one last week, so we're going to continue that. So there's a lot going on. There's a lot of good things. Like I said, the big uh, national plan to end Parkinson's hopefully will pass soon, which will take change the United States. But I'm going to continue uh, finding others' journey because the only sad part about this for me now, besides the loss of my mother, is the journey out there that I'm not aware of or I don't know. So there are people out there that are changing the world for Parkinson's and they just don't know about me yet or I don't know about them. And that's what my uh, inspiration is. I've had the opportunity to interview Muhammad Ali's daughter and some other leading families who have been affected uh, been trying to reach you know, Robin Williams, a successful actor who passed due to Louis Bada dementia. So it's not really about celebrities, but they do reach so many people that I'd love to talk to the families, not exactly the celebrities, but really how does the family, you know, how do they cope? But I think that we're all family in this by giving the opportunity today to speak to you, your audience becomes my family and mine, hopefully yours. And I'll share this, you know, forever. I don't believe in just having one talk and a podcast and see you and never see you again. My dream is to keep sharing it over and over because this is not going to stop until we find a cure. Very, very powerful message. And with that, let's take another break and listen to a message from our commercial sponsors. I'm Catherine Kerrigan, medical intuitive healer. We're listening to George Ackerman, the co-host of the Together for Sharon podcast. So George Ackerman, uh, when I worked with a gentleman with stage four Parkinson's disease, it was really quite moving for me because usually I, I work with people long distance all over the world by Zoom. And I also see people in person here in Atlanta, but usually if I see anyone in person, I make them come to me because of traffic and driving and so on. But in his case, I drove to his home and one of the things that really moved me was that even though he had stage four Parkinson's disease, he was still reading the deepest, most profound spiritual literature. And I think that one of the misconceptions about people with Parkinson's disease is that they're going to lose their intellectual capacity. Now, at the same time, he, he was reading these incredibly profound books and also writing the most beautiful prayers, some of the most beautiful prayers I've ever read in my entire life. From your experience, what are some of the biggest misconceptions that people have about Parkinson's disease? Yeah, I think a big problem is they just are worried or uh, I've had an unfortunate story where someone on the social media TikTok was actually reported and banned because she was shaking. So that some person, I won't you derogatory, but uh, they reported her and said she was drunk and an alcoholic, but that's not what she had Parkinson's. So one of the worst misconceptions, in my opinion, is if you see someone, you know, don't say anything and don't make them feel bad. It might not be what you think just because of your knowledge or lack of uh, one big area. I'm actually looking maybe to do a book on and hopefully change the world is the law enforcement field. Again, we don't have the time in policing, even in the academy, because I've taught at the police academy, to really even talk about Parkinson's. So guess what? If someone, let's take myself, has Parkinson's, which I don't, but if I'm pulled over and I'm just involuntarily shaking, that officer comes to the window with a weapon. It's dark at night. It's a bad area. Who knows? And they see me shaking. They're not going to have any idea that it could be Parkinson's, and we have to change that. And again, I don't blame law enforcement. They just might not have the time or, you know, the knowledge. So it needs to be brought to their attention. So that's something I really do have in my heart want to work on. But I think the biggest misconception is that people just don't know what it is. They might be even scared. 
Uh, there's just a lot of areas that really need more awareness, and that's what I'm trying to do. Now, can you talk about the National Plan to End Parkinson's Act? National Plan to End Parkinson's Act. What is the goal of this legislation, and what is its current status? Yeah, I'd love to. I mean, it was just the other day where we uh, heard, and it's on my website too, so throughout the world, but that it actually moves from the, a committee to the floor. So it's actually going to Congress for a vote. It's a bipartisan bill for all parties, and uh, it's going to help fund research, help patients with hopefully financially medical for medicine and the caretaker. So there's three or four major areas, but we've never had, for some reason, any United States legislation in history to help Parkinson's patients and caretakers. So it's just historic. I was really lucky enough by a contact by the Michael J. Fox Foundation to call and have a little voice chat with my local congresswoman. And there were three individuals who had Parkinson's and myself on the call. I was on their behalf of my mother, and we got to share our stories for three minutes. And I have to tell you, I uh, did that. I, pra I speak a lot. So I practiced that for a month, easy, like nothing. And I put on my website, about a minute or two through, I fell apart crying because there was one sentence where I always wanted my mother to, her favorite thing was blowing bubbles in the backyard with her grandkids. Mm -hmm. And due to Parkinson's, she'll never be able to do that. So that was tough, but the, you know, everybody was crying. So they were happy I fell apart because, you know, it's very important. It's we're not here as a game. It's not for fun. I'm not making money. There's a reason and a purpose for it all. And that's to help support those still going through it. The, and I find myself today, sadly, in a weird world. It's in one point I don't have Parkinson's and my mother passed. So I'm kind of forgotten. And I'm actually working with an organization called the PSP. Uh, and they're hopefully going to help me start one of the first ever, uh, uh, you know, not spiritual, but it is spiritual, but support groups for those who have lost their loved ones because of uh, Parkinson's. There's nothing in my view, in my research out there today for someone still grieving. And even though it's been four years, there's not a day that goes by that I don't miss and think about my mother. So George Ackerman, are there any tests that people can take to detect Parkinson's disease in its early stages? Yeah, I would recommend to see a medical professional, but there are because it's specific tests medically. I don't have the name that they can take to test the different issues and the loss of abilities in their movement. But it all, you know, depends on age. Unfortunately, now we have young onset Parkinson's, so people are even at 40 years old, 50 are getting it. Uh, but this age is also uh, hereditary. They don't know yet. Uh, they don't think it's genetic, but we're not 100% sure. But we mentioned earlier the exposure to pesticides. But they do have, uh, I would recommend to see a neurologist, but they have movement specialists. So it's not just a regular uh, neurologist, but a movement specialist and those Doctors are fully trained to uh, do tests. Now, we've had problems, again, where people are misdiagnosed. So it's called Parkinsoniums, where you see the signs, maybe the shaking, but they don't have Parkinson's. Well, if this is not treated properly, you're going to end up taking medicine that's wrong, and that's going to cause irreparable damage. So it's very, very important to do your own research. Don't rely on me, uh, you know, but in your community and, you know, even look at the national ones to some great uh, people out there uh, and the people who've written great books is one called ending parkinson's disease by four really uh, important researchers who i had a great opportunity to interview two or three of them so you know you definitely want to do your own reading your own research but again we started this today to talk about communication and i think it's critical with your own family to communicate and with your doctors now in my in my healing room, I have test kits for heavy metal toxicity and common heavy metals that can that we know can damage the nervous system include aluminum, mercury and lead, cadmium, nickel and more. And, you know, lots of people think, well, I don't eat metal, you know, cans, but <laughs> if we have heavy if you have metal fillings in your mouth metal fillings in your mouth that degenerate over time are primary causes of heavy metal toxicity. From your experience and research about Parkinson's disease, George Ackerman, is heavy metal toxicity a factor in Parkinson's disease? 
I can't really comment on that one, but I do feel that pesticides and a lot of the uh, molds could be. My mother lived in a beautiful home for 15, 20 years, but I don't think she really kept up with it. She had uh, she had treatment for termites. She had treatment for pests, you know, bugs. She also had molds. So guess what? Back then, 15, 20 years ago, who knows what these companies were putting. So it definitely had toxins in them. Again, I can't be confident 100%, but I do feel that a lot of that. So that's why we moved her. Unfortunately, in 1999, uh, 1998, 99, she moved to a brand new place with beautiful, all clean, no issues, but she was already too late. So that year is when she didn't even make it to the end of the year. You know, she passed on one, one, 2020. So it was too late in my opinion. I feel though, if we had pulled her out again, I wasn't aware, you know, 10, 20 years and I didn't have the funds. Maybe it would have made a difference, but I do agree that uh, and feel that there could be definitely uh, a relation between toxins and chemicals and what we eat and where we live 100 percent. But again, I, I have no scientific proof, but there is research out there for it. Now, here at the Natural Healing Show for UK Health Radio, we've had a number of interviews about glyphosate, also known as Roundup, which is a known neurotoxin, which contributes to a wide range of issues including ADD and ADHD in, in children. So if you think about the progression of children eating toxic foods, then they take medicines for ADD, ADHD, which set them up for Parkinson's later on. You can see how that this is a, a, a society-wide problem. And we've also had experts talk about mold toxicity and mold can cause all kinds of brain symptoms, including basic brain fog, and also set you up for cancer. So if I've got a client with cancer, for example, as a medical intuitive, I'm going to look at, is there a mold in their body? Um, so that's interesting that you feel that pesticides and mold may possibly be risk factors for Parkinson's wow. disease. I think they banned uh, they banned Roundup, I believe, and also now there's something about Paraguay, which is since uh, that's a big problem. And then there's a famous study and case called Camp Lejeune, which the government has shut down due to water contamination, and they think that that not only causes Parkinson's, but like you said, many other unfortunate diseases and symptoms. Now you were your mother's caregiver. Are among many that you hired for $12,000 a month, bless your heart. Do you have a helpful message you would like to share to all the primary caregivers for people with Parkinson's dementia or other neurodegenerative conditions? Yeah, love and support your loved one. Be yeah. by their side, hold their hand, and cherish every moment. Because uh, again, I was shocked how quickly this disease took over. Uh, there's nothing like the feeling of uh, helplessness. That's how I felt because uh, it wasn't just for my mother, but also for myself. There's not much else I could have done, but so I'm confident of that. But I feel that what I'm doing today is important because if we could just reach, you know, one person and have them aware, maybe they can fight this disease earlier. Then we've done an incredible thing and we've changed the world. So that's the main message, uh, you know. And that's it. It's really sad because sometimes I'll have a table at an event for, uh, you know, Parkinson's awareness. And we're just there handing out bands and people sometimes are scared to come up because they think we're selling something because we're in the middle of a lot of pharmaceutical places and, you know, devices. And then when they realized that we had one specific example, an elderly man was in a wheelchair, he couldn't speak, he had a Vietnam hat. So I went up to him and he was able to understand what we were doing. He started crying and I hugged him and that's the what pushes me to keep doing this. So, you know, we are reaching people and changing lives, but, you know, it hurts at night. Some nights I don't sleep again, just trying to think of ways through social media or even live to uh, spread more of the advocacy for Parkinson's awareness. So on behalf of people with Parkinson's and caregivers everywhere, I really appreciate your heartfelt efforts to share this information and my comment is that if you are a caregiver of anyone with any kind of dementia, neurodegenerative disease, or Parkinson's, realize that energetically you are supporting two people. You're supporting yourself 
and you're supporting someone with a progressive disease. It's a law of physics that energy always flows from highest to lowest potential. So if you find yourself in the role of being a caregiver, it's absolutely critical that you take exquisite care of yourself. And it's very easy to forget yourself as a caregiver. Um, a couple of months ago, one of my best friends had a heart attack. I actually took him to the hospital and to the emergency room when he was having the heart attack. And then I supported him while he was having open heart surgery. So again, if you're a caregiver, you, you need to realize that energy flows from highest to lowest potential. So the healthier you can be, the happier you can be, the more that you can take care of your own self, that is what you give to others. So I, it, I remember being completely exhausted, running back and forth to the hospital every day. And then I had my friend in the home. So it's really important that caregivers take care of themselves. So George Ackerman, when you were taking care of your mother, when she was alive at the end, what helped you the most to take care of yourself? Uh, really, I think part of the problem was the not, the uncertainty. I think that's the word. Because I really didn't know, you know, was this going to go on for a day, a year, 10 years? We had no idea. No medical professional could tell me. Uh, I even pulled the doctor out of the room with my mother and said, look, doc, she's going to live. And he couldn't say it. So it's a horrible feeling to live with. I definitely had a lot of issues. I saw a psychologist, but didn't stay with them because luckily I have a great wife to support me. And even now she's helping me write the book and uh, she's always been there for me. You have to have that one person to support you. We had an amazing family, but unfortunately a lot of them couldn't, some weren't even in the area. Others wanted things, but kind of ended up felt, making me feel like I'm in a battle. Because I just wanted what's good for my mother, and they might have wanted what's good for her, but they were coming from some other perspective. It was almost like, a, you know, making it more difficult for me. There were so many interrelationships and interesting topics that come from caregiving. What pushed me through really was just in my heart, I wanted her to be here forever. But then there was a part of me that realized, you know, unfortunately, it was better that she wasn't suffering anymore. It's towards the end. I mean, we don't have something called death with dignity in Florida which was shocking because we treat our animals better than our loved ones. So for the last seven days of her life, she wasn't even alive. She was just had a heartbeat and we were just surrounding her with the family seven days. I mean, it was, we didn't know when it was going to, so that was the kind of stuff that I don't normally talk about just because I want these to kind of be a little happy and positive, but you have to, you know, discuss the tough topic like death with dignity. You have to discuss medical licensed marijuana, which we tried that didn't work. But if I believe in if it helps someone who's, you know, dying, why make them be in pain? But unfortunately, still under the law, uh, Parkinson's is not an end of uh, disease, an end of life, which is sad, too, because we went through it. So, again, uh, you just have to keep your head up, keep positive as much as you can and know that you're doing, uh, you know, something good for someone you love. And again, I was shocked that even today I'm being told how they want me to come on this podcast because they don't see many male caregivers and I'm shocked still because I didn't even think of gender and any, like it was just my mother. I don't care, you know, about anything, but I would have been by her side through anything. And, uh, you know, that's really the only thing. And again, you're never alone. You have to just reach out, look up www.thatstogetherforsharon.com just to kind of look. I had an amazing story. Someone told me they spent 10 hours on the website. <laughs> I didn't ever dreamt that would happen. I just thought that we put it out there. But when you read other people, if you have Parkinson's and you read, you know, 100 other stories, you get inspired that you have a chance and you're not alone. Thank you so much for everything that you're contributing to the planet, George Ackerman. And for our audience, you can find out more about George Ackerman and his wonderful work at togetherforsharon.com. You've been listening to The Natural Healing Show for UK Health Radio. I'm your host, Catherine Kerrigan, medical intuitive healer, Amazon number one bestselling author. You can find out more about me at katherinekerrigan.com and unlimitedenergynow.com. While you're there, definitely sign up for my newsletter so you can learn even more about how you, your, 
can heal yourself naturally. And if you or any of your loved ones are suffering from Parkinson's disease, definitely reach out for help and give yourself permission to receive all the love and support that you deserve. Thank you so much for listening and we'll see you next time.